The following is a conversation with uh, Scott uh, Soms, professor of uh, philosophy at the University of uh, Southern California and previously professor of philosophy at the University of Princeton. He specializes in uh, philosophy of uh, language and the history of uh, analytic philosophy. The topics of discussion of today are uh, indeed the philosophy of language and some uh, history about uh, analytic philosophy. I hope you will enjoy this conversation. And this is back to the Stone Age. Professor Soms, in your uh, book, uh, What is Meaning? You mention uh, that the meaning of a sentence is not a thing that exists in uh, isolation. It is an abstract entity, a proposition which serves as the vehicle of uh, truths and falsehood, and then which we can grasp uh, through understanding the sentence. Mm-hmm. You have written this sentence, you have written this quote in uh, your book, uh, What is Meaning? So let me ask you, with probably one of the most uh, fundamental questions in uh, the philosophy of language, what is uh, mean? Is, uh, is it something that exists independently of our human minds? Is, is what something that exists independent of our human minds? Do you mean meaning or propositions or what? Meaning. Meaning. Meaning is really a kind of cognitive significance. It's the content that an individual word or phrase contributes to the thought that we express when we use a sentence that we understand. There are typically conventions governing the use of individual words or phrases, conventions about the reference of proper names, about the concepts expressed by general terms, about the formation of predicates, uh, which are then applied to singular terms, to definite descriptions, or proper names. Um, And there's a certain uniformity in this, which is expressed in language, because the different languages adopt different conventions for the syntax, the morphology of the language, and also for rules extracting what is meant or said or asserted by sentences of the language. Those rules uh, are divided really into two types. One is called the semantic rules, which give us semantic contents. And those are the things that a language learner has to learn in advance. They're specific to individual languages. Uh, Then the second kind of rule is how when we use one of those rules, we make use of the context in which we are speaking, the background assumptions of the speakers and hearers, and the central questions that are being addressed at any given point in the discourse. That's a domain of linguistic science called pragmatics as opposed to semantics, but they combine together, which give us the messages that are delivered by assertive utterances of normal declarative sentences. Are these two domains uh, that you just mentioned uh, sort of independent uh, of each other, or do they work, uh, let's say, in uh, synergy, I would say? Well, of course, uh, they, uh, they are to a degree independent, but they also have a high degree of coordination. There are grammatical sentences which don't make a great deal of semantic sense, but they're perfectly well formed. Um, And there um, there are different ways different strategies that get used for how you combine the part that is given by the semantics, the theory of meaning, um, 
and how you combine that with presuppositions that are present in the in the discourse. Okay. Could I ask you how do words refer to things? How can I name an object or how can I assume there is a relationship between an object and the name that I refer I am referring to by naming this yeah. Uh, object? Yeah. Well, proper names like your name and my name, uh, the names of our countries, the names of the language we speak uh, or the languages we speak are almost always picked up by individual language users from others uh, in their language community. And when you pick up a proper name, you typically have the intention that you're going to use it to refer to whoever or whatever those from whom you acquired the name referred to. And they picked it up in most cases in the same way. And so there's a chain of reference transmission uh, that could, in principle, stretch back to a baptism of some place or some person or something like that with the name. Other people after the baptism, as we might say, uh, pick it up from the original introducers of the name intending to refer to the same thing. And that chain can go on indefinitely long of reference transmission. Individual users, depending on their own circumstances, will often come to associate various properties with different names that they've picked up, which they believe uh, apply to the reference of the names that they're using. And this can change over time. Sometimes those are accurately and correctly applied to the referent of the name. Sometimes they're not. Uh, but in the standard case, the name is just a label for the thing named. Uh, and that's what it contributes in the standard case to propositions expressed by sentences containing the name. Uh, but of course, I mean, there are also cases of names changing meaning over time. And that, that is a whole interesting process of how that occurs and what happens, but it can happen um, because you're always using the name for some particular purpose at the time. And if enough people who have picked up the name in one way start applying it in a way they didn't realize differs from the referent that they got it, over time that will change. That will change the meaning of the name. Okay. You mentioned a reference process when naming the name of an object or a proper name better. I would like to ask you what happens to this uh, reference process in case of, uh, for example, mistaking uh, an identity. When I am uh, pointing uh, towards uh, someone, I am naming someone, and uh, in my head, a certain reference process uh, takes place. Whereas mm. uh, in your head, uh, an actually different uh, reference process takes place and you end up mistaking uh, the person uh, I was referring to for someone mm -hmm. else. What happens in this case? Um, what happens is in the standard case there, uh, that you described, there may simply be a mistake. That is to say, you have predicated identity of the individual's 
Cicero and Tully. And they are this one and the same individual, perhaps. I think they are. <laughs> That's the standard thought. Uh, but you may not realize that. You may think that's a mistake. Uh, and if enough people came to think that, then we would have to wonder about what they were really meaning by the name. Okay. Could I ask you what is the relationship between language and logic? Because a very essential concept uh, to logic uh, is of course the concept of uh, truth what is uh, yeah. truth how do we evaluate uh, something to be true however to me sometimes um, I have the sensation that the concept of truth is uh, intrinsically related to how our language is built uh, not specifically the English or Italian or whichever uh, language we uh, speak right. but into the intrinsic properties uh, of how humans communicate with each other. So could I ask what is the relationship uh, between language and logic? Um, well, I'm going to focus on truth as well. But the first question we have to ask is, what are the things that are true? What are these things which have this property of being true? And what does that property consist in? And there's a variety of things that we call true. We call some sentences true. We call some statements true. We call some assertions, which are another word really for statements, things stated true. And I think a very fundamental question is, what are these things that are stated or asserted, and what is it for them to be true, and how is that related to a sentence being true? So this is an area of the philosophy of language in which there is wide diversity of opinion. Uh, and its reason for that is we tend to feel that sentences thought of merely as forms of words with certain syntactic structure and certain phonological properties, we can call sentences true. But when we call a sentence true, it's true depending on, or we're assuming, what we're saying is it's, it's true because the statement it's used to make is true. The belief it's used to express is true. What is it? What are these things? The statement that may be true and the belief that may be true. And to define truth, we really have to first have some idea of what a statement is or an assertion is or what are the things that we believe what are these things you can call them beliefs but what are those things that we believe that you believe and that i believe even though you may use one language to express that belief or make that assertion and i may use a different language to make that assertion franco had a word for it which you probably realize what was his word? Do you know? No. Thoughts. He called them thoughts. Bertrand Russell had a word for it. He called them propositions. And that's what we're really after when we're asking about 
what truth is. We've got to figure out what are these things that are true, which are bear a relationship to sentences, but we only call the sentence true when the thing that it bears this relationship to is true. But why do you feel the need, or why is there this uh, reasoning in which we firstly have to define what are the things that can be true before mm -hmm. defining uh, truth itself? Because I have recently read a book on um, sort of a, uh, it's called a sort of a um, philosophical hallucinations, and uh, it explains philosophical uh, hallucinations. And it explains um, his point where some people might argue that there has to be a sort of a, a sequential order in which we firstly talk about uh, ontological problems, uh, so what is that exists, uh, and subsequently we talk about metaphysical problems. Uh, what is uh, that which exists? So what you said reminded me of uh, this sort of um, reasoning. But is that the case, or why is that the reason that you firstly want to define what is true before defining what is true, truth itself? Oh, the things that are true. Okay. It's because I think of truth, and I think we all think of truth, as a form of accuracy. And we want to know, what do we mean by this accuracy? And there are lots of things that we can evaluate. Sometimes we ask whether our perceptions are accurate. Um, we don't usually say, are our perceptions true? Uh, sometimes we can say it of very good books that they're very accurate. We almost never call a book true. Um, now, of course, truth is related to accuracy, but it's a special form of accuracy. We need to identify what is, there's a certain thing, call it a thought, or call it a proposition following either Frege or Russell, and what do we think about these things? We say the earth is round. Well, that is a proposition and it represents something, the planet we live on, and it represents it as being round. Um, what is truth then? The most simple answer to the question that we start off asking in this way is that a thought or a proposition, the message of a given assertion or use of a sentence is true just in case it represents such and such as being so-and-so. And you know what? Such and such is so-and-so. Uh, and what is this thing that's the bearer of truth? It's the representational thing, the thing that represents. So what is it for it to be accurate? It's for it to represent something as being this way, and it is this way. That's, I think, the proper order. I would like to ask you, do you believe there could be such a thing, and let me explain what I mean by it, a sort of theory of relativity of truth? in the sense of um, an analogy to the theory of relativity uh, that we have in physics, that of course uh, uh, eradicated all our conceptions uh, that by the time were deeply rooted in uh, physics and in the scientific community of an absolute uh, space and absolute time. Albert Einstein yes. showed us, uh, in, introduced us to the relative notion, uh, to the notions of relative space and time. Could there be such a thing as uh, uh, not anymore absolute truth uh, instead of uh, uh, relative truth. I don't know enough to be able to speak um, with any degree of confidence. 
I don't think there that I don't I, I one of the things that happens in ordinary language use before we even think about physics is that the effect of the context in which a sentence is used on what it is used to say. And we have words that are context sensitive, context sensitive and they pick up aspects of the context. So probably the best example is the first person singular pronoun. When I say, I am hungry, I'm talking about one person. And when you say the same words, you're talking about a different person. What's another example? Now, when I say it is now such and such a time, that's relative to a given instant and a given place. Could there be an extension of these ideas which took into account relativity in the sense of, you know, speed and all of that and location and motion. Um, in principle, I don't see why that couldn't be incorporated into our normal scheme if we were talking about those things in a systematic way. And maybe if physicists were to talk about them in a systematic way, we could include that as aspects of the context of utterance in which we are speaking. Um, it would be just another kind of context sensitivity. Language in principle should be able to handle that. Would it have a use in ordinary speech of ordinary people? No, probably not. Uh, but it might have a specialized use. I don't see anything present, uh, preventing that. Do you think that without humans, uh, the concept of truth uh, would still be in place or is truth uh, an intrinsically related to human uh, notion because i am uh, for example for example fantasizing on whether humans were not existing uh, or any other form of uh, life uh, ex expanding on the concept of truth existing in this universe uh, the concept of truth uh, would not be discussed uh, discussed uh, would not be uh, talked about uh, nothing would, would not be discussed, be discussed. yes exactly. of course um, however things would be still be true it would be true that there is a there are it's... planets uh, that particles uh, are the way they are. Uh, things would still be true. However, there would be no one talking about them. So is truth related to human nature or is it, intrins uh, let's say, independent of humans? Um, is truth related to human nature or is it independent of human? This reminds me of the way I think about a certain semantic paradigm, which is very popular among philosophers and linguists today. It's called possible worlds semantics, which you may be familiar with. Could you say it for the speak for the listeners that don't not know? Yes. Um, the idea is, let's start from a very simple idea. That to understand the meaning of a sentence, and in particular what it is used to say, is to understand its truth conditions. The conditions under which a use of that sentence is true. The basic idea behind that is we use we use sentences to think and talk about the world, and we value truth because we value having an accurate conception of the world. And so we aim for our remarks to be true, to accurately describe the world. 
That's the basic idea behind the truth con conditional conception of meaning. The possible worlds approach to semantics is a particular extended theory of that type. It issues theorems of the form sentence S is true at a for all for all worlds W, they say. Sentence S is true at W if and only if at W, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And if you ask yourself, what do they mean by that? Um, what they mean by that is roughly this. I'll put it this way. Um, I'm going to, uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about world states rather than worlds. By worlds, they don't mean the earth. They mean the universe. And there's only one universe, I think. Uh, and um, what they mean when they say uh, that S is true at W, if and only if at W, so-and-so, they mean if the world, for all states the world could have been in, the proposition that we hear and now use S to assert would be true if and only if uh, the world were such, would, uh, is true at W if and only if um, that proposition would be true if W were the state that the world was really in. <laughs> so it tells you all the different ways that it's possible for this universe to be. And when we say S is true at W if and only if blah, 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 we're saying it expresses a proposition. That proposition would accurately describe the world if the world were in state W. Okay. So that's a way in which we can talk about the truth or falsity of propositions we assert or hypothesize or assume, what whether they would be true or not, even at world states that didn't involve any human beings. And we would like to do that. I mean, we really very much need to do that. Um, now, there's a further step, which I believe the, this first step is a good step. The second step, I think, is a bad step. Uh, and that, and then if you ask them, well, what is the proposition? You, you, you talked about this, the proposition that we here and now use the thing to use the sentence to express would be true at a world W, if and only if, I don't know, snow is white at W, um, whether there are human beings or not. Um, they say that the proposition expressed by a sentence is the set of possible world states at which it is true. Yeah? So that at least addresses your question, but now you should worry. Why should you worry? I feel like being under class, uh, in a class uh, <laughs> with a lecture, but anyway. <laughs> what is being assumed if we go all the way I just, through the story I just told you, what is being assumed about necessarily equivalent propositions? I wouldn't know now. Okay, what they 
typically assume is the proposition expressed by a sentence is the set of possible world states at which it is true. That means necessarily equivalent propositions are identical. Propositions true at the same world states are identical. Okay. They're the same thing. They say the same thing. Could that be so? I would say no. 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 I don't think that can be so. Why, why were you thinking no? Well, because the set of all... Uh, the set of all... Uh, correct me if I'm wrong again. The set of all possible uh, words... World state. At which world state. the proposition we here and now use the sentence to express is true. Think of mathematics. Well, it is like having... Um, oh, let's say there is a... One is a sort of a pure uh, mathematical statement. Uh, sorry, is a pure statement, uh, whereas another one employs uh, quantifiers. Well, that you can have, you can employ quantifiers. That's okay. Okay. Well, employing quantifiers, uh, however, you range uh, overall. Uh, uh, well, this there's a question of what we're going to allow the quantifiers to range over at any given time, and that, and it's really a choice that's made in the context of utterance. Okay. We can just say the things that exist at this very world state, or we can quantify sometimes, I think, over things that don't exist but could have existed. Um, and it's just a matter of adjusting the domain of the quantification. But the thing you don't want is necessary, necessarily identical propositions and necessary equivalent propositions, true in the same possible world states, to be one and the same proposition. Because then there's only one necessary truth, and everybody believes it. And um, only one necessary falsehood, and nobody believes it. Um, and that's just not true to our experience. That's that's just not what propositions are. So that, okay. but nevertheless, the technology of all of this is very widespread, and it's a it's a kind it's a modal logic, a kind of modal logic, which is you know a kind of specialized logic. Um, but it's doesn't give us the right account of what propositions are and what the sets, different sets of truths are. And so here's a, here's a second point, which I'll just say, you might think it's because we're thinking of things that are too big, possible states that the universe could be in. Suppose we think of them as partial. A, a, a given sentence doesn't talk about all the different things that might go on in different possible world states. Maybe we should evaluate them not at possible states of the entire universe. Maybe we should evaluate them at smaller, what we might call truth-supporting circumstances, situations, such that if they were the actual, then the proposition would be true. We're going to get a lot more situations, abstractly possible situations, than we are possible states of the entire universe. And what is the advantage in doing so? Pardon? What is the advantage, uh... Well, it was thought in the 1980s and into the 1990s that this problem I was bringing up with possible world semantics would be fixed uh, if we just make the relevant possible circumstances that we look to to evaluate 
individual sentences, conjunctions of sentences, disjunctions of sentences, and so on, we looked at partial states. We could make more distinctions. And we could distinguish different propositions, each of which are necessarily true, but they're nevertheless true in different possible situations. Or you might even consider impossible situations. Anyway, there's a general result. The same problem that arises from the possible world semantics can be recreated in this new domain. So you can't really make progress that way. We need something else. We cannot take propositions to be sets of possible world states. We cannot take propositions to be sets of possible situations, sets of possible and impossible situations. Versions of the same problem always come up. So now what do we do? So what happened in the philosophy of language? Well, there's quite a few people who ignore this, but um, what happened in the philosophy of language following Kripke is Kripke himself was, he never wanted to tell us what propositions are. He didn't know what they were. Uh, and in a way that was rather nice and, and, and honorable of him. Um, but we need some account that will deal with some of his problems, which I think you alluded to. Identities, necessary identities. Heat is kinetic energy. Water is H2O. Hesperus is phosphorus. Heat is kinetic energy doesn't sound like heat is heat. Uh, similarly for water is H2O. Similarly for Hesperus is phosphorus. We're fine with Hesperus is Hesperus. Uh, but Kripke wanted to say Hesperus is phosphorus is necessary a posteriori. And similarly for heat and molecular, uh, mean molecular kinetic energy and water is H2O. So what are these things, these identity statements, these identity propositions, how could they possibly be necessarily true but knowable only a posteriori. That was the main unanswered question of naming and necessity. And Kripke himself brought up a version of this problem, what was it, in 1979. Uh, called A Puzzle About Belief. I don't know if you're familiar with that article, but if you're not, you might look at it. Um, and he reproduced that problem in a very simple and direct way. So it applies to all sorts of ordinary propositions. Do you know the story of that article? I don't. Okay. Do you, do you want to explain? Shall I tell it to you? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there's this Frenchman. He lives in Paris. He's monolingual. He would love to travel, but he can't afford it. But he still visits the travel offices and he's seen uh, posters of London, which make it seem very beautiful. And he buys some and puts them up in his room. And he forms the belief that he expresses saying, Londres est jolie. Um, something happens in Pierre's life, and we're not told exactly what, 
but he gets at some point trans, uh, transferred to London itself. He doesn't speak a word of English, but he finds himself living in an unattractive part of the city and he has to learn English by immersion, simply by slowly talking to English speakers, figuring out what they're saying, and he comes to master English. But he's living in a very bad part of town. And what is the name of this town? Oh, it's called London. He doesn't make the connection between Londra and London. He continues to believe that Londra is Uh, But he now is convinced that London is not pretty. And yet, he's very smart, he's a terrific logician, he makes no logical mistakes. Um, and yet he ends up with this contradictory belief. Now, what should we think about that? Um, how is that possible. And this wasn't just an identity statement, which had their own special problems. This, this, this could happen with virtually anything. And Kripke didn't know how to respond to the problem. He, he stood by naming a necessity, but he wasn't able to use this example to clarify the point that you originally raised about identity statements. And I think there's a way of doing that. And I think it involves having to take a step, a creative step, and add something to our notion of what are these things that are true or false? What are these things that are stated? What are these things that are believed? Well, we know that they are things that represent the world or parts of the world as being this way or that. They have representational content. I think we need to add, in addition to having representational content, they have cognitive content. And in particular, the cognitive content can vary in some cases in which the representational content is the same. Uh, and that's what happens with the identities, Hesperus is phosphorus. Heat is mean molecular kinetic energy, water is H2O, and Londres is joli, and London is pretty. What do we do? This is my idea, my solution, my, which uh, I think I first articulated in 2010 and then in a book in 2015. Um, that um, propositions are, put it this way, acts of thought, what goes on in thought. We think about things as being certain ways. When I imagine something to be so-and-so, I am predicating being so-and-so, a certain property I'm familiar with, of a certain thing that I'm familiar with. And I'm thereby representing that object as having that property. But I'm doing it via certain mental representations. It could be images in my mind. It could be perceptually or it could be 
um, using words like Hesperus versus Phosphorus. If propositions have these two dimensions, what do they represent as being what way? And how is that representation brought about? And if the second can vary to a degree independently of the first, then we can get examples of the necessary a posteriori that distinguish Hesperus is phosphorus from Hesperus is Hesperus. And water is water from water is H2O. Otherwise, if we don't do something like this, we cannot, in my opinion, save those types of examples of Kripke's necessary a posteriori as genuine examples of the necessary a posteriori. That was kind of a long story, but <laughs> there it is. What would be what would be the first thing you would ask and want to discuss about with Kripke, Kripke's if he was still alive? Among the set of possible words that you would want to that you would want to discuss, what would be the first thing that has the most priority to you? Well, the thing I just talked about, the thing that has the most priority is, Saul, what are these things that are uh, necessarily true, but can only be known on the basis of experience? You're not going to tell me their sentences. I know that. But you've never expressed a view about what they are. And what we need is to have some better idea of what they are so that we can answer these questions about the identities, but also the very puzzle that you brought up about Pierre in France and London. Saul, who was my neighbor for, I don't know, 15 years, um, he didn't like to take chances. He was very cautious. He didn't know what to take propositions to be. So he just stated things as neutrally as he knew how. But we are now at a stage, and I think we have to confront these problems and see where they lead. What would he, what would he say? I hope I could convince him that they are cognitive act types of the kinds that I've argued, but I don't know whether I could. Do you think do you think he could be convinced of your idea or would it take would it take much more work than that? Here's what. I would like to think so, but I am not confident. Here's something that sounds very strange if you adopt my view. Propositions are things we do. They are act types. What were you doing yesterday? You'd never answer, well, I was doing this proposition. Uh, it's 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 a kind of theoretical step that doesn't have an ordinary locution that sounds natural. And he would worry about that. I mean, one of the things about Saul is he didn't, he wanted to avoid all mistakes, didn't want to go out on a limb. You just you just you just uh, um implied, you just pointed out that. Following your view implies that propositions propositions are the things we do. We do. Right? They're act, they're types of cognitive acts or operations. What do we do when we think? Okay. Because I was That's about the to way I approach to... it. We think of this thing and we think of it as being this way. 
And what's okay. what do we do? What do we do when we see something? We focus on the thing and our perceptual experience without us having to make any effort represents it as being this way or that way. So one of the things you need in cognitive propositions is you need perceptually based cognitive propositions in which you're talking about a perceptually formed belief that represents uh, in which in which the property you're predicating is predicated of something that you identify perceptually. And that's different from what the proposition that would be representing the same thing in the same way, which you in which you identify the predication target, the thing that the property is being applied to, the thing that is a certain way linguistically. Those end up being representationally identical, but cognitively different propositions. So it's possible to believe one and the negation of the other. Doesn't that lead to intricacies? Uh, not, I, I wouldn't say inconsistencies, but doesn't that lead to sort of um, conceptual intricacies uh, in understanding uh, the nature of uh, what we're talking about? It certainly allows you to, in a certain way, contradict yourself because <laughs> you're representing the same things as being in contradictory ways. But the propositions themselves, one is not the negation of the other because included in the proposition is how you're identifying the objects of the predication. But it's still you can you can be led into things that couldn't be true, even though the one isn't the negation of the other. Okay, this is a very tricky part. Uh, yeah. I would say, <laughs> <laughs> say what do you consider that's this? Just a fact. That's just a fact about us, and the fact that we can get in contact with something and think about it and attribute properties to it via different modalities. Sight, sound, touch, language. Would you consider this view and what you have just proposed as your biggest contribution to philosophy? I don't like to think about my contributions to philosophy. Okay. I, I am, um, it came, as I say, in around 2010, I started as a professor of philosophy at Yale in 1976, so it came late in my career, and it came as a result of trying to fight my way through all the things that led up to it. So it allowed me to put more things into a single perspective than I had been able to do before. I put it that way. How much of a contribution it is uh, remains to be seen. There are some others who have various, their own versions of this type of view. And um, some linguists, uh, some philosophers. So... Uh, I think it will be one way of thinking about things, but we just have to push it further to see where it goes. Do you believe living philosophically is a pursuit of uh, happiness, uh, truth, uh, or something else uh, entirely different? Something as entirely different from what? From what? Then, uh, um, then uh, being a pursuit of a uh, happiness. Uh, uh, happiness. It's not the pursuit of happiness. A pursuit of truth? Pursuit. I think it's a fundamental part of the pursuit of truth. And I think philosophy, if you look through the history of philosophy, starting with the pre-Socratic, Western philosophy, 
starting with the pre-Socratics and moving all the way up to the present. What you'll find, and it's still true today, is that philosophy is not a kind of separate, isolated discipline on its own. It's really the partner of any advancing discipline. And it, it tends to come into play when enough is known to make systematic inquiry into a given domain possible, but problems arise in the framework that people are using to do that investigation. And philosophy tends to come in and say, well, why don't we conceptualize this in a somewhat different way, in a somewhat new way? Uh, and perhaps we can make progress and get beyond whatever the temporary difficulties are. I think to be in philosophy today it's important, not in every aspect of philosophy, but in many aspects of philosophy, that you know, not just philosophy itself, but you know some, to some degree, some other discipline. In the case of philosophy of language, you should know a fair amount of linguistics. In the case of philosophy of physics, you should know a lot of physics. In the case of philosophy of mathematics, you should know quite a lot of mm -hmm. mathematics and, and even you know logic too, you should know a fair amount of mathematics. And philosophical psychology, um, this, even philosophy of history, I think, I think this is what philosophers are for, that we should be interacting with all living disciplines we should we should have some of our colleagues being up to date on these things and being capable of making contributions to them and you know i've just in the time i've been doing philosophy uh but just in the time i've been at usc i mean we had a a philosopher of physics for a while until we lost him to pittsburgh who um, had degrees from Oxford in both philosophy and, um, I mean, doctoral degrees, philosophy and physics. Um, we have, I have a student now who's doing a dissertation with me in philosophy of language. And he just finished a doctorate at, um, in mathematics at um, Oxford. Uh, we have, Lots of people like that. I don't mean we all have to be that way. I'm not that way. Well, I had some linguistics. Um, but um, this is, and, and there's a second part of that. You're, you're not going to find single big pictures produced by philosophers. I don't know, in the way that Leibniz and various historical philosophers did, Aristotle. Um, you're going to see philosophers who have to know another discipline, at least one, pretty well. And they're going to produce a picture of an area of intellectual space that is not comprehensive, but it, it covers their areas of overlapping expertise and different Philosophy is going to not give us single grand pictures. They're going to give us series of overlapping pictures. That's, I think, the future of philosophy in the Western world. I have previously mentioned that of how, or I've previously asked you about of how truth might be, apparently, intrinsically related to the nature of uh, human beings. Whereas I would like to ask you now, language is surely intrinsically related uh, to the nature of uh, human beings. Yes. Thus, what are the limits of language? It's a very general question. I, I'm being 
pulled in different directions thinking about trying to answer it. We know that there are some at least seeming limits of a mathematical sort about under what conditions, if any, can languages contain their own truth predicates. Um, so th there are limitations of that kind. Um, and what I want to say about my own view is that this notion of propositions that I've become so interested in, a lot of the propositions that we consider are thoughts, as Frege said, are expressed in language, but not all of them. Um, and some of the thoughts we have probably resist expressions in language. Look, walk into a room, walk into a library, one wall covered with um, bookcases and books and there's tables and chairs and windows and all people are sitting in various places. You take in a great deal just by looking around for a few seconds. You get a lot of information. That information is could be thought of as a very large number of interrelated propositions. There's no way you can articulate all of them. And your grasp of them, yes, you do predicate properties of these various things, but your grasp of them can't be fully articulated. And even when it's pretty clear to you, very often you can't express to another person exactly what it is that you're taking in. There's too much information. It's too fine-grained. The great thing about language is that we can make sentences long and complicated and all that, and they can be subject to a single judgment, true or false. But when those are when those are cognized, when the arguments are cognized perceptually as opposed to linguistically, we have a hard time distinguishing similar propositions from one another, and often we simply cannot communicate those differences with other speakers. Because there's too much information, it's too fine-grained, we don't have words enough to do it. We're not precise enough to do it. Those are limitations. Um, another thing that's interesting, I guess I may have written some of this in the notes. Um, you know, you know, um, Tom Nagel, you know, the philosopher, Tom Nagel, Thomas Nagel? No. no. Oh, he was, he was quite a famous, he, he left, unfortunately, he left Princeton the day I arrived and um, went to NYU. He was a great philosopher. Um, he wrote a paper called, What's It Like to Be a Bat? And he wanted to say that we kind of have no conception because they have such a different cognitive system than we do that we can't, we're tied to our own cognitive and perceptual systems. And so we have no way of, of knowing or saying what it's like to be a bat. What my take on that is at some level, bats do the same thing we do. At some levels, they do it differently. What do they do that we do? They locate things in time and space. Um, and they can say, this is near that, or this is whatever, and they can find them. They represent, their propositions represent some of the same things 
that ours represent, even though they do it perceptually in a way that's very different because we don't have their sonar system. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't find out what it's like to be a bat. It just means we can't be bats ourselves, but we can study them and find out what they're representing as what way and what inferential pathways are open to them through their perceptual system that aren't open to us through our perceptual system. That strikes me as interesting. That strikes me as something that philosophy can contribute to stuff outside of philosophy. Um, so this element that I'm concentrating on has, has built-in limitations for us, but it's a conceptual framework that has enough distinctions that we can go beyond what we've been able to go do in other sort of information processing systems. Okay, I understand. I have once thought about a somewhat not controversial, but I would say probably not shared view of uh, the limitations of language while I was discussing uh, precisely this topic uh, with the. Uh, the friend of mine, uh, Stefano, that uh, studies uh, philosophy, mm -hmm. and I thought about, I thought about every time I speak, uh, and I pronounce words and sentences, uh, I am trying to convey the image I have in my mind. The yes, uh, let's say the thoughts, uh, as we said, the thoughts I have in my mind uh, to someone else. Uh, yes. mind. However, these thoughts. Uh, except in rare, I would say, situations, probably in a mathematical settings, other than yes, in a mathematical yes. settings, all these thoughts, or let's say all these words, are rough representations of my thoughts. And thus, every time I pronounce a word and I assign a label, sort of a limit to one of my thoughts, my thoughts lose some of its, let's say, authenticity. And thus the image, the mental image, the thought that I convey to my friend, Stefano, ends up not being precisely the same thought that I had in mind, but a somewhat rough representation of what, of what I was thinking about. And, and, and I thought like, it looks like as if you are taking a path, you are walking along, along a path, and every step that you take, you are sort of, sort of losing up a little bit the true meaning of your thoughts and I thought oh well that's somewhat discouraging in uh, trying to make myself be understood by friends there is no way of avoiding what you're talking about <laughs> it is we want two things we want precision and we want completeness we want to be able to make everything precise and be able to communicate that completely through language. We cannot do it. There are inherent contradictions because of the nature of our thoughts, the nature of the information. Some of it is shareable. Some of it is only possible to share indirectly by getting them to have some of the same experiences that lead us to this verbalization that we come up with. And I think, though I haven't done very much on this, I think this could be true in the realm of values and morality as well. We, Sometimes when we're faced with a difficult decision about what action we should morally take, we kind of find ourselves thinking, well, there's something to be said on each side. And we look for a rule that will tell us uh, this will break the tie. 
there aren't going to be enough rules uh, to break these ties. But one thing that can happen is when you know your action is going to affect another person that you are close to, if you can get yourself to, I, I don't know quite how to put this, somebody whose feelings you've been exposed to, somebody whose face you can read, um, and you remember a time, let's say, that you did something that you thought wouldn't bother this person, and then you remember the look on that person's face uh, afterwards, and it just strikes you. All of a sudden, you know what was important to that person and how you let that person down. This is an aspect of our thought as much as any verbal description that we can give. It's a kind of perception of their feelings, of their emotions, as they show them to you in their faces and in their actions. And all of this should be parts of evaluative propositions, just as perceptions of color can be parts of uh, visual, uh, visually accessible propositions. But you don't see this appreciated or, or talked about very much, but I think that's my take on what you what you said. Okay. Do you? I come. I come from a more mathematical background. I have studied uh, statistics, uh, econometrics, and then I am been doing uh, extra math courses. So I am interested in uh, sort of uh, hypothetical infinite processes, uh, mm -hmm. the usual uh, limits, uh, and so and so. And I would like to ask: Do you find a concept as an infinite language? Uh, powerful in descriptive power, in descriptive uh, capacity, because I am thinking, uh, let's say, disregarding the practical uh, meaning of uh, what I'm about to say. If I keep on adding uh, terms uh, to the naming of an object, uh, intuitively, I would say I am adding uh, accuracy, I'm adding precision because I am uh, providing uh, my the person that I am talking to, I am providing more and more information uh, up until, uh, yeah, let's say, in an infinite way, such that uh, in the limiting process, uh, this understanding will be perfect, which thus requires uh, an infinite language, uh, which is not humanly achievable uh, in so. a finite amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, where there are limitations to our capacities, and 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 we have to realize that, and we have to we have to find ways of accomplishing something in the nature of what you're talking about without having to introduce more and more specialized, precise concepts. And it doesn't all have to be linguistic. If you become attentive to other people, you can communicate in ways that you'll find end up being effective. And you'll find that they've communicated to you, even if it wasn't their intent exactly to communicate to you. But you will have information that will move you. And um, that's what I think is really important about applying this in a kind of moral domain. Okay. I would like to ask you whether you feel sometimes the, or have you felt sometimes in your uh, career as a philosopher and in, a, in an academic environment, uh, the urge to have answers to your deep philosophical question, or whether at some point you started accepting uh, that 
the questions that you have been spending most time working on might never find an answer. I don't really think, I don't worry about that. Why? I think there are better and better answers, even if there's no end to the process. <laughs> and I am pleased when I feel I've made progress so that I can account for more, even though there's plenty of things that still puzzle me uh, and I don't know what to do. Um, I think that's just the nature of the enterprise. And I'm, I'm perfectly happy to make any progress that I can. Were there uh, ever uh, sort of uh, mental uh, switches that you had to make uh, during uh, your mm -hmm. career after which uh, things uh, and uh, let's say reasonings uh, after which things started clicking more easily that were yeah. yet difficult to accept, some sort of a tough yes. belief to leave aside, but after which you were more free and bound to and unbounded in your reasonings and your work. Yes. Um, yes. Um, I don't think I've thought very much. I, I thought, what did I think of philosophy of language when I went into it? I thought it's about truth, reference, and meaning. And so I took particular problems and tried to make some progress on individual problems. Um, but I didn't think, I didn't think about propositions. I, I, I was not puzzled about propositions. I should have been puzzled about propositions, but um, I wasn't. I realized early on that they can't be sets of possible world states, but I thought they could be these abstract objects, structured propositions. And then I thought, I, I don't remember quite how it happened, but it was around between 2005 and 2010. Well, what could these things possibly be in order to represent things in the world. Now that, well, what, none of the candidates pleased me. In what sense do they represent the world? You, you, you haven't told me any coherent story. And so the idea that they might be events or they might be actions, I started playing around with that and thinking about it and rejecting it and coming back to it. And that's, when I began to feel freer, when I thought, I don't know where the road ends here, but this is a step forward. We have to, this has been the weakest part in philosophy of language in the analytic tradition, the, the lack of a correct account of propositions or even a promising account of propositions. And so that still interests me a lot. Now, I do other kinds of work now. I do some philosophy of law now, and I do um, quite a bit of the history of analytic philosophy now. And I'm quite interested in those things, just because I'm naturally interested in those things. But I also think that um, philosophy of language has a lot to contribute to the interpretation of legal texts. Um, so I think there's a practical aspect to it. And I've interacted with people at various law schools and that sort of thing. So I think it can make a positive uh, contribution to the world. And that makes me feel that we're doing the right sort of thing. Otherwise, otherwise, um, I don't think I've felt this connected to this wider range of things uh, in the early part of my career. Let me see if we agree on a certain uh, aspect of philosophy. Philosophy is a branch of knowledge uh, where we, where experimental verifications uh, are not a part uh, of the mm -hmm. subject. Okay. Whereas this is absolutely the opposite case uh, when it comes to physics. 
for example, or any other type of science. Do you think that this lack of experimental validation is an advantage or a disadvantage to philosophy? Well, we couldn't do physics the way we do philosophy, that's for certain. <laughs> I think probably, and I don't know very much physics. Um, I think there's a challenge to understand the physics. I think there's a challenge to understand the relationship between physics and chemistry and biology and economics and all of that. And nobody's equipped to do that by their scientific dif discipline alone. So we have to have philosophers who have some knowledge of various things that can be connectors. Uh, and philosophers are more and more going to have to be experts in something other than philosophy in addition to philosophy. There are going to be more and more people who are going to have two PhDs, one in philosophy and one in another discipline. Okay. During the past century, we have seen a, an absolutely remarkable uh, technological advancement, uh, which, as we have uh, witnessed, uh, benefited immensely the branch of uh, physics, uh, for example. And in general, we could uh, somewhat generalize that uh, branches as uh, science, uh, physics uh, specifically, of course, benefits uh, from uh, a more advanced uh, technological uh, and engineering uh, outlook, uh, more engineering uh, um, skills. I would like to ask you, how do you see the philosophy of language evolving as uh, technological progress uh, keeps on going? And uh, how do you see somewhat the philosophy of, of language being influenced by the techno technological progress, uh, which has greatly influenced uh, many other areas of knowledge? if there is any such benefit that technology can give to the philosophy of language. I still think that the central concepts that I've talked about, there's, there's related concepts, but truth, reference, and meaning are going to be important for understanding every area of human thought. <laughs> and it's just going to require more knowledge of these different areas you talk about um, in order to bring what they're doing into an understandable relationship to what philosophers of language and logic and mathematics uh, and the special sciences uh, do. It's going to be a bigger challenge, and they're going to have a challenge in communicating both with those in the related areas and with other members of their own philosophy profession and department. Because if everybody in philosophy has got a foot in another place, we still need to be able to talk to, to each other and be able to profit from work in other areas of philosophy. So people are going to be in school longer. They're going to be doing more and more research. Um, whether the economy can support all of this, with people producing wealth directly, some of which can be spent in these ways, I, I'm no expert. I don't know what to say. That, that will be a limiting factor. What do you see as the most pressing, uh, broadly philosophical issue of the 21st century? Well, probably one I don't know anything about. Um, <laughs> I don't know. People talk now about the philosophy of AI. And um, I don't know really um, much of anything about it. But I think we in our department will 
probably be looking, well, we have somebody who does a little of that, but I think we're going to look for more. And we'll see, and we'll, we'll be interacting with places in the university that we haven't interacted with a lot. For example, engineering. Computer science is in the engineering department at um, USC. And so we'll be interacting with those people. Um, we already have an undergraduate course in, um, the, in which we interact with them. Philosophy, technology, and value, I think it's called. Um, and I think, I think the challenge is to continue to talk to people in an interdisciplinary way and to be able to keep what's distinctive about philosophy um, while interacting with those people, because that's the nature of Western philosophy. It hasn't, it wasn't, isn't the nature of all forms of philosophy. Uh, it's the nature of Western philosophy since the pre-Socratics. Which philosopher, uh, past uh, or present, uh, do you think that most understood, uh, that understood well the human condition and why? I don't have a single person to name. You um, can name up to three. <laughs> up to three. <laughs> um, This is not something I think about every day. Um, I kind of like, if I have to name some famous philosophers, I like Aquinas for one. Um, who else do I like? Um, I like Hume for another. Um, more modern. The greatest philosopher of my era was Saul Krippi, but I wouldn't say he had the greatest understanding of the human condition. Um, Uh, I'm just going to put in a kind of political philosopher who I think made an important contribution. Not everybody likes him. Friedrich Hayek. And if you could have a conversation with any philosopher in history, would it be any of these four philosophers or would it be someone else? And what would you discuss? And now you can pick only one. I can only pick one. Um, <laughs> let me see. I'm trying to decide between two people. Who are they and why I are one side between them? Huh? Who are they? I, Who I are these two people? And... I think it's David Hume. Why? He was very broad thinker. He was a historian. He was a metaphysician. He was an epistemologist. He had views about value. Um, and he had great influence in a variety of ways. I mean, I think he very much in influenced Charles Darwin, for example, um, through uh, Charles Darwin's grandfather being a student of Hume. I would like to talk to him about all the stuff he wrote about, including the history of England um, and his view of human nature, which was 
at the basis of his views about values and morality. Do you think his contributions uh, could be, or at least one of his contributions could be the biggest leap of philosophical genius ever accomplished in the history of uh, philosophy? Or would you attribute it? Uh, would you attribute this to someone else instead? I I I don't think. I I don't think that I put anyone philosophers' achievements above David Hume. Um, I do think two people that I would love to cite weren't really philosophers, but they had philosophical minds and um, they were influenced by philosophers. One was um, Isaac Newton and the other is Albert Einstein. What did Albert Einstein say about Hume? He said he learned a great deal from David Hume, maybe more from David Hume than anyone else. And he said, what he learned is that you don't have to accept everything in common sense, provided you can find a way of explaining why the common sense exists, but why it needs to be pushed further. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, if David Hume could hear that after death, he would have been very happy and proud. He was also, he was also just a fantastic person and a fantastic friend. There's a letter that was written, I forget who, Adam Smith wrote the letter about his great friend, David Hume. Uh, I forget who he wrote it to, but he, described him as like the nearest thing to human perfection that can be imagined. He was a great, good humored, brilliant, pretty modest man. Do you think that pursuing uh, philosophical inquiries uh, and philosophical questions uh, throughout your lives uh, inevitably lead you to pursuing uh, a better, more ethical life to being a, a better person? Yes. Why? <laughs> you have to think about what you really believe and why. You have to figure out what's the most important thing or things. And you have to have enough, develop enough independence to know that if you think about it long and hard enough and carefully enough, you, you may not be right, but you will, what you've come up with will be honest and respectable and not self-seeking. I don't think there's any room for self-seeking in philosophy. What is the, probably this is more of a historical uh, point of view, more of a historical question. What is the origin of a language? I don't know what the origin of language is. The closest thing that I've thought some about goes back to the early Greeks. And it goes back to the transition during Plato and Aristotle's time from an oral culture to a written culture. And 
I'd never, before I studied some of this, I'd never thought about the difference between the two. But there is an enormous difference. You could not have the kind of investigations, logical and philosophical investigations into the great domain of subjects that were illustrated by Plato and Aristotle had their culture remained an oral culture. It was in the process of transition uh, when Plato uh, opened the academy. Um, and the written word was very important to them. Look at what we've what we have from Plato. From Plato, we have the dialogues. From from um, Aristotle, we have this massive set of works on all sorts of different subjects, and you have critical reasoning. You cannot have critical logical reasoning when education was mostly a matter, an oral tradition, and learning the the epic poems and, and, and the songs and things like that. Plato gave us the first university. Uh, that was his academy. And he emphasized rational, critical thought. I think this was the most important moment in Western philosophy. Do you believe language to be one of the greatest uh lives for the human uh, for human beings uh, in developing uh, their society technology. absolutely absolutely yeah nothing else could be compared nothing to is even close in, at least i think <laughs> what is the most beautiful and fascinating uh, philosophical concept uh, that you have ever uh, heard of concept an idea I, mean, I just have one thing to say and I don't know exactly why I say it truth truth and you see that back with the early Greeks you see the emphasis on truth Yet I feel sometimes that truth in many cases could be a human construct eh? that in many cases, uh, again, is uh, dependent on our set of, uh, on our condition, on our uh, relative, uh, let's say, yeah, on a, relative to our environment, relative to what we believe and to, yeah, what, what language also we adopt. So I would say, is truth a concept in the universe that is greater than the sum of its parts? <laughs> its parts are individual truths. Those individual truths can be richer or poorer, can be more significant or less significant, um, depending on the full array of concepts that uh, and uh, objects that are the constituents of the propositions that are assessed for truth or falsity. We, we have a rich cognitive capacity for generating thoughts, coherent thoughts. And we have learned to make them more and more precise. And we always have a goal in mind. We want the truth about more and more. Truth, the kind of thing we want remains the same. The extent of it 
the precision of it, the level of fine-grained accuracy, that is always evolving. Um, so I just wish that people would put even more value on truth uh, than they do. There are people who come out with claims that I very much disagree with. They can be political claims or moral claims or things of that kind. But so long as they're honestly and accurately trying to get at the truth and they're willing to open themselves to investigation and questioning about why they think what they do, the fact that they're, if they are really not just looking out for their own advantage, but if they're really looking for the truth and they're willing to say the truth about a wide variety of things, including the importance of other people, then that's the highest value for me. Professor Sons, it was an extreme pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for this conversation. Well, thank you. This was a conversation with uh, Scott uh, Soms. Thanks for following. Thanks for being with us. I hope you have enjoyed this conversation. This was back to the Stone Age.